Well, good evening on this Good Friday as we have come uh, here this evening for our Good Friday Tenebrae service. Um, just a, a few words of sort of what to expect and some direction tonight. Um, we'll hear readings from the Passion narrative in John's Gospel. Uh, different folks will come and read those sections throughout the service, and as they read their passage, when they're done, they will snuff a candle out in the lights will get a little dimmer, so don't think your glasses have stopped working or your optic nerves are failing you. Uh, but the lights will get a little dimmer until uh, the last reading when the center candle will be snuffed and the lights will go out. Uh, if it's overly dark and a few seconds after the last candle and the lights go out, the squares will be relit uh, to sort of help you get uh, uh, into the foyer. But when we are dismissed, if you will, uh, try to keep silence in the sanctuary and then maybe once we go out the doors, pick up any conversations and those sorts of things you'll have thereafter. Uh, tonight's service is a solemn one as this is a solemn day, Good Friday, when we commemorate the death of our Lord. And as we've come into this place this evening for worship, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, our Savior, our friend. Lord, tonight as we come into this place to remember your great sacrifice for us, help us, Lord, to feel your presence here with us. Remind us, Lord, that we cannot have an Easter Sunday without a Good Friday, that we cannot have resurrection without death. That, Lord, on this night when we remember your death, God, may we remember it as we bear the weight of our own mortality, as we remember the deaths of those we've loved and who've gone on before us. But Lord, may we remember your death for what it, re what it is, what it means to all of humankind, a great act of love, your endless and eternal love for us. So tonight as we worship, as we hear from Holy Scripture the story of your passion, your death, your crucifixion. Lord, may we be mindful of your presence here among us, and may we be mindful of your presence as you go from this place with us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you will take your hymnal and turn to 513, 513. Oh, how he loves you and me. Uh, let's stand as we sing this. passage that I'm reading tonight is on page 880. I'm reading from John chapter 18 verses 1 through 14. 
After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciple across the Kindred Valley to the place where there was a garden, which he and his disciple entered. Now Judah, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priest and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said this to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fill the words that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into the shoes, and I am not to drink the cup that the Father has given me. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Capius, the high priest that year. Capius was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Tonight, as we remember the death of our Lord Jesus, we pause to also remember those who have died, those who have passed from this side of eternity to the next over this last year. We pause to pray for those who still mourn their passing, for those who still mourn the passing of those who have left us some time ago, for those whose lives still feel somewhat incomplete in the absence of their friends and loved ones. We pray for those who mourn, for ourselves, because death is a very real part of life. Good Friday reminds us of that, and it reminds us that there is no resurrection without death, no reunion without a parting of ways, no Easter Sunday without a Good Friday. So as we pray together, I will call the names of those who have died this last year from our community. There will be names I've forgotten, Names I've never known, names that are strange to you, names that are close to you. But as I call their names, as you remember the names, I can't. Pray for their friends and family as we all travel on a little while longer, waiting for the coming day of resurrection when we will be reunited with those who've gone before us in the eternal joy of Christ's love. So let us spend a few moments together now in silent prayer for those who mourn, for those we've lost, and then I will close us with a word of prayer and the reciting of those names. So let us pray. Eternal God, creator of life itself, savior of creation, and spirit that calls us to new life. On this Good Friday, we pause to pray for those who mourn. We pray for them, Lord, knowing that you have joined them in their sorrow and their pain, for you have felt those same feelings as you hung upon the cross. We pray for them, remembering the women who were there at the cross, remembering those who took your body down and placed it in the tomb. We pray for those who mourn as surely as your disciples mourned your death. And we pray for you, Holy Spirit, to be with them in their grief, in our grief, as we continue on for a little while longer on this side of eternity. Tonight, 
We pray for the friends and families of Horace Haynes, of Gladys Lipscomb, of Hollis and Joyce Welch, Jerry Andrews, of Kathleen Wigley, of Riley Marie Green, Rachel Green, of Catherine Yake, of Bobby Johnson, of Carolyn Cunningham. For the friends and family of all those, Lord, who have felt the heartache of death, and for those who live each day in the shadow of grief. Lord Jesus, we pray you be with them, and be with us as you call us to be your presence in each of their lives, reminding them of the hope that comes only from you. Be with us, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy name. Amen. John 18, 15 through 27. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty, and brought Peter in. You're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear had Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. You will take your hymnal and turn to 185 when I survey the wonders cross. We'll do the first and first and last to stand again as we sing.
John 18, 28 through 40. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. We, but we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priest handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of, the tr of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Will you join me as we pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John 19. <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers were a crown of thorns, wove a, a crown of thorns and put them on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I have no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate, Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given from you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. 
From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king set himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone of Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The king priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. And he handed them over to them to be crucified. Our next hymn is a 181, uh, we, and we'll sing the first verse, and you can stay seated if you like, okay? John 19, 16 through 30. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Gothea. They were cru there they crucified him and him with two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to feel, fulfill this, what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew what was now finished, he said, in order to fill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of a hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
do the second stanza of 181 now. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a, great, a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Let's stand for verse 3 and then remain standing for the scripture reading, for the last scripture reading. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited, visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body the two of them wrapped it with the, with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial, Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. <clears throat> 